Hello, I'm Hajime Suzuki from the University of Tokyo. And uh, first, I apologize that the title of my talk is changed from that I previously. Hi, Shinkokusta no Totsiga, Simasen. And first, I uh, tell you <laughs> my background. And I, I am a master course student at the University of Tokyo, and I am interested in an algorithms and, and uh, code tuning. <laughs> and I am a, a parallel comp computation guy. And my project is a graphical pairwise local alignment. And the concept is uh, illustrated in this figure, and uh, that is uh, the graphical pairwise local alignment is a problem to find a set of high scoring paths between two string graphs. The string graphs is the one uh, defined by Jim Myers in the 2005 paper. And the figure shows that this mask also here. The uh, yellow segments in the graph one and graph two are aligned, and uh, three segments from red, yellow, and purple are aligned. And the another alternative alignments can be found might be found between red and green and purple paths. That is a uh, graphical local alignment. And uh, graphical local alignment problems can be solved with the conventional seed and extend strategy of finding seeds between two graphs with uh, such a k-ma hashing and extending the seed between upward and downward. And uh, input sequences can be represented in a fast way or GFA formats with uh, modifications, modif modified with VCF variant files. And the generated alignments can be re reported in some or the other alignment files. My uh, algorithms adapt uh, banded alignment on graphs. That is, what is uh, extend the banded matrix from the seed found in two graphs and uh, expand the uh, two graphs into a tree whose root is fixed to the uh, C, the C. And uh, this sort of task can be done with my uh, library, libgaba and libggca in the same parallelized way. My uh, prototype program, Coma Liner, can be found in the GitHub repository. Uh, this is not stable one, but can align only small toy graphs. Input at output formats is FastA, FastKey, and GFA. Outputs are reported in SUM and GPA format. GPA format is my uh, uh, experimental format for the graphical pairwise alignment. A text-based tab delimited format for the graphical pairwise local alignment, uh, which is similar to the graphical fragment assembly format. In this hackathon, I would like to uh, let me know any suggestion on the software and the GPA format. And I'll continue debugging to make it stable. And uh, I hope I could show you some uh, illustrative example of uh, actual sequences found in database. Thank you.
Done. Thank you. <laughs> so the next speaker is Ben. Uh, so this is just a redo. So uh, sorry. Um, so I'm Benedict. Uh, so I direct the computational genomics lab at UC Santa Cruz uh, Genomics Institute, um, and this is a redux of a longer talk I gave last year, where I talked about the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health APIs, which um, is a kind of um, global effort to try to standardize genomic data sharing. So genomic data sharing is a little different to some of the data types we've talked about today, primarily because it's uh, relatively homogeneous. We have relatively few different types of data. We have reads, we have variants, um, various associated things. Um, but they're very big. We have petabytes and petabytes of them within contemporary projects. Taking something like the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, that's 3.1 petabytes. Um, the UK 100K project is 20 petabytes, and you know, the TopMed project is going to be another order of magnitude bigger than that. So we have a really big, big data heavy problem. So. Um, that data, for reasons of secu security and privacy, is stored in repositories all over the world. This is the, the sort of uh, cartoon that we always show um, in which, so we have a sort of series of genomic silos in which the data is held. And although those individual projects are large, uh, none of them is really as uh, big enough to gain the kind of statistical uh, significance that we really want if we're to kind of win in precision medicine. So the dream here is to essentially create a set of standards to connect up these repositories um, and wire them together using an API. Um, so the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, just a tiny little bit of background. Uh, there are now, I think, some 380 uh, organizations who are members of the GA4GH. Um, I and uh, my boss, David Hauser, are um, keenly involved in the data working group, which is trying to define the APIs. The APIs themselves um, are basically standard REST APIs. Um, we have, you know, we've used Protobuf, we've defined a schema for the API, uh, for a bunch of fundamental genomics data types that I'll mention in a second. Um, and we have developed, um, you know, REST methods for accessing them. And uh, we're kind of going through the process of trying to get a large number of parties to implement these APIs to enable sharing of genomic data um, across a, a bunch of different projects I don't have time to talk to you about. But here's the vision. There's interoperability across this space. Um, so in the last year, this is really the payoff here, um, we have added um, a whole bunch of different data types to the API. So we started off last year with reads and variants. We've now added sequence annotations, um, various uh, extensions to the reference sequence model, various bits of uh, metadata, variant annotations. There's now a genotype to phenotype module, an RNA expression module, which is about to drop in the next week or two. Um, and we now have working software for all of this and a whole bunch of compliance tests and so forth. So uh, a lot of it is uh, starting to feel like a real software project. Uh, and we have implementations both at Go uh, Google, who, so as part of Google Genomics, they've implemented the majority of the API. Uh, we've built a, a reference server. If you go on J4JH GitHub, you can go and look at that, uh, that implements everything in there. Uh, the EBI has also implemented a bunch of stuff, nearly done. Um, so uh, just if, if anybody, uh, this is a developer-friendly meeting, if anybody's interested, uh, this URL here, you can go and look at all the thousand genomes data um, being served uh, on an Azure box, serving uh, all the data through the GA4JH API. Um, it's about 75 terabytes of data for people's context. Uh, and I don't, because this is PDF, you won't be able to see, but, um, but as an example, um, a few weeks ago, we had an SAB, so we challenged one of the developers to write like a genome browser against it. And within a week, um, they had built a kind of really cute genome browser, which would be animated if we were on the Google Slides, but it doesn't matter. Um, that would show you uh, show you how data can be pulled down and and done, and you know how we can do nice things with JavaScript. Um, so, thank you. Uh, there was also a picture here that I guess missed out. But anyway, uh, the picture was uh, supposed to show what I was going to work on uh, this bio hackathon. So uh, completely separately, I've been working on this thing called Toil, and uh, I'll stop. Uh, and I want to uh, wire it up to the uh, RDF representation that we now have for metadata for containers so that we can uh, do cool things. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is... Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, three slides. Okay. 
Thank you for having me. And I'm just so my name is Orion Buskey. Um, I'm a PhD student in Toronto, Canada, and I'll just be giving sort of a brief overview of some of the work that we've been doing on patient matchmaking, in particular for rare disease patients, um, in the context of a, a larger project called the Matchmaker Exchange. So the challenge that we're really facing uh, in in rare genetic diseases that that Ben sort of laid the groundwork for is that for, for rare genetic diseases there's this big problem of trying to find additional families in order to validate the genetic causes of, of some patient's diseases. You might sequence one person, come up with a set of candidates, find a gene of unknown significance, but you need to find additional families in order to confirm that. But diseases uh, particular for, particularly for the rare diseases, those patients tend to be spread all around the world. It's very difficult to find cohorts, and that data is siloed. So there are a few approaches. Uh, one, you can try to centralize uh, the data into a database that's better than all of the others, uh, but everyone's trying to do this, of course. So the Matchmaker Exchange was really an approach to try to federate these different platforms uh, so that they can talk to each other, so that data that's entered into any of them can be matched against data that's found in any of the others. So the Matchmaker Exchange was this effort, um, sort of a pilot project from the Global Alliance and ERDRC that got support from a large number of different organizations and databases that had patient information for the purposes of sharing data, exchanging phenotype and genotype profiles of actual patients uh, for the purposes of finding the cause of rare and undiagnosed genetic diseases. So the matchmaker exchange is really trying to solve the problem of a clinician or a researcher asking the question, has anyone seen a case like this? Where you have a phenotype that's been described using standardized terminology, such as the human phenotype ontology. You may or may not have clinical diagnoses, such as OMIM and Orphanet terms. And you might have a set of candidate genes, for instance, HGNC gene symbols or ensemble gene IDs or something like that. So in collaboration with those set of organizations, we came up with a shared a uh, data model, and in collaboration with the GA4GH, basically summarizing what I just said there, these terminologies, and, and laying it out in terms of a JSON API that's on GitHub. The way that this is implemented practically is as a server-to-server -server data exchange within a closed federated network. So servers authenticate to each other. A clinician or a researcher has a patient. They deposit it into one of those organizations, there's no central node, they have to choose one of these databases to deposit their case. That case is then used as the query to send out a query to these other databases. Those databases respond with the most similar patients. Uh, those get collated and shown to the user and people get notified. So we published an, uh, a special issue of the Human Mutation Journal, which has 16 open access papers. You're welcome to take a look, uh, including a nice overview paper and a summary of the API. Uh, currently, there are three main organizations that have active connections, uh, Phenome Central, Gene Matcher, and Decipher, which have varying numbers and varying types of data, whether they're full cases with phenotype and genotype and sometimes exomes, or whether they're CNV-focused cases with, with a few candidate variants, or whether they're you know, genes of unknown significance. And those are all connected using an initial version of the API. As of this year, there are a large number of other organizations that are either fully done with or have mostly implemented the API and are in the testing process. Um, these, the ones that I've listed there will probably have live implement implementations by the end of the year. Uh, and then there are user interfaces within the various systems for viewing these results. For instance, within Phenome Central, you can see the most similar other cases in the other databases, and then you can drill down to the phenotypic and genotypic similarity. Um, there's an open source reference implementation on GitHub, and the version, the next versions that we're working on have to do with really incorporating exome data into this, um, and as well as patient-led initiatives. So collecting information directly from patients and then including that so that clinicians and researchers can find patients that haven't necessarily been sucked up into the clinical infrastructure. And there are a whole bunch of people who've been involved in this from various organizations, um, and mostly I'm here to help help 
the various Japanese initiatives get set up with the matchmaker exchange work on. Uh, there was some privacy preserving matchmaker exchange implementations that were sort of in discussion. And if anyone has any questions, please come up to me and let me know. Okay. <laughs> so next speaker is Seth. Uh, Great. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm probably going to be the first one to not make the five minutes. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about our group and about the Noctua tool. And if there's any time, I'll discuss some of the other projects that our lab has. So we're the Berkeley Bioinformatics Open Source Projects Group. We're not usually this happy, but it's a good picture of us. We're in uh, Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, oops. PIs are... Uh, Susanna Lewis, Chris Mungle, and we're working on a lot of different projects right now, such as the Gene Ontology, Monarch, Apollo, some of OVO stuff, Gmod. Whoops, this is an old slide, old bot end code stuff there. Um, and so what I'd like to mostly talk to you about today is a new um, graph editing tool that we're, we've been working on called Noctua. And so let's just start with this. So if anyone is interested, this tool is live. You can take a look at it here. Everything is open source and up there. So not to a collaborative editing of biological processes. Um, and so this is actually an instance graph editor that we're using to uh, annotate biological processes. So let's go a little bit into that. So one of the problems is that mods, curators have been using tabular formats basically for their own internal databases. And we're trying to open it up so people are using sort of graph information for all of their annotations. And this can be generalized to a lot of other things. The tool that we've made is collaborative, online, real-time, so people can edit one part of the world and see it show up in the other part of the world as they, um, as they edit live. So this is what it looks like. Um, and I'll go through this just real quick. So people can uh, put in different processes, uh, uh, biological processes, uh, genes, location, and then start knitting them together, just drag and drop. And so let's look a little bit at the abstraction that we're using. So we're using Lego. This is uh, by uh, Paul Thomas and YU, uh, me down in uh, USC. And so essentially what it is is instead of the typical sort of linear way we've been doing it with GAF files and stuff like that, where it's just gene, term, evidence, we're putting a little bit more information in there where we have uh, gene, cellular location, and the process, and then we're able to start knitting these together into larger formations so we can see that both of these are part of uh, the exit from mitosis process. And to sort of get a little bit more geeky about what's going on, this really is just sort of a graph underneath. So while we have a layer that's used by biologists to sort of model things in the way that's very intuitive to them, it looks like sort of, you know, something they might see in a paper elsewhere. Underneath, this really is sort of the graph, and you can see the evidence is split out. We do some tricks there. So if you want to take a look, this is getting into the real nitty gritty of how this, uh, mo we model our evidence. And one of the reasons we spend a lot of time sort of with a more complicated evidence model whoop, <laughs> uh, is that we want to be able to also uh, capture things like, uh, for example, we want to be able to federate uh, with other databases, so we're working with Techspresso Central to be able to have them come into Noctua and go out from Noctua to be able to pick up spans from papers attached you know, to publications that are part of the evidence. Every piece of evidence, every action made with this tool captures both the curator and the, uh, the date and a lot of other meta information that hasn't been captured before. So there's a lot of depth we can add to this automatically that we weren't able to do before. Um, and so. Just going over quickly about the architecture. Um, so we've tried to uh, make this very expandable and very flexible. So it's a three-tier architecture. The client, the graph editor that you saw earlier, is completely separate. There's a communication layer, of course, written in client JavaScript. Communication layer written in Node.js. Backend written in Java. It's using the OWL API. And currently, it's writing files to disk as uh, uh, instant graphs, um, separate ontologies. We're currently looking at sort of graph stores and uh, RDF stores to be able to make that a lot better. Um, so this is one client. We also have a form version of the client. 
for, this is for phenotypes, this is being used by Monarch. Uh, and then we also have uh, a Repel client. So this is very flexible, very easy for programmers to get in, very good format. Um, probably not gonna be time for that, but a whole bunch of other projects that we're doing, please see me. Uh, we also do Amigo, uh, geospatial annotation capture, all sorts of other stuff, some analysis. And I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Super fast talk. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that's about it. So hi everyone, I'm Alessandro, I work for the Ensemble team at the EBI. Well, first thanks to the uh, organizers, and in particular to Professor Yutaka Suzuki for the invitation, which is the opportunity for me to talk about a very, very simple tool, hopefully useful, which has been developed in the concept of the uh, HIEC, the International Human Epigenomics Consortium. As a disclaimer note, I haven't worked directly on this tool, nor I am involved in the consortium. I'm sort of an intruder here in this biohackathon. I present this work on behalf of Dr. Uh, Richardson and colleagues who, for various reasons, couldn't come here. So, the context is Hayek, whose goal is briefly to produce and archive more than a thousand reference epigenomes from both normal and diseased tissues. Doing this requires, you know, the coordination of data production across different member projects to ensure that the data that is generated is useful for comparative and integrative analysis by other member teams, but also by the wider scientific community. In order to do this, Hayek uh, follows an approach of distributed data production, following the success of you know, other successful projects like ENCODE and 1000 Genome projects. However, uh, the production of these community data resources at this scale and across different locations poses substantial challenges for the collation, the standardization, and the sharing of these data. Uh, a few words about the data that Hayek is currently handling. Uh, well, different member projects submit their raw data into public archives like the European Genome Phenome Archive and the uh, Gene Expression Omnibus. The data that is submitted must adhere to the standards and definitions defined by the, the consortium. For instance, our complete reference epigenome must contain, you know, the data for the core set of assay types, you know, methylation, histone modification, RNA seq, but uh, various members may opt for submitting additional data for some of the samples, which is not in the core set. Over the course of the years of the lifespan of the project, some, uh, well, the main problem that has been identified is that the uh, structures of the metadata in, in these public archives do not provide effective methods for linking the experiments that comprise a, a, a particular reference epigenomes. But in particular, to facilitate the sharing of these data, the biological material used to assay the reference epigenomes and also the location of this data must be known and readily available. So, Hayek has identified the need for a system for tracking, accession in a reference epigenomes, but also where the different member projects submit their raw data. So, meet EPR, EPIR, which is uh, a tool designed to meet these challenges. In particular, it holds public archive accessions for the raw data associated to one particular reference epigenomes. And as I've said, it provides accessions for each one of these epigenomes. In this way, we can look at a reference epigenome as a discrete data set so that the different you know, members can look at it as a coherent unit which is ready for integrative analysis. As for the data model, well, it is obviously assumed that a particular reference epigenome belongs to one and only one member project and it receives an accession upon submission. It is also assumed, assumed that 
the reference epigenomes will be submitted before it is completed, so updates are supported and there's also a versioning scheme to ensure identification of the data set and up incremental updates of the metadata. As for the workflow, submission workflow, it's all very simple. It accepts, you know, submissions in plain text or JSON. Besides parsing and checking for syntactic errors, it also validates metadata associated to each component data set, raising errors if the metadata is not descriptive enough. Uh, the metadata associated to each experiment is used to assess completeness, completeness against the HIEX standards. Uh, if everything goes well, uh, the tool assigns unique identifiers to each reference epigenome and it returns a representation of it uh, as stored in the tool. It also summarizes key experimental characteristics of the reference epigenomes, for instance, whether or not it is based on a simple or on a full of samples. Finish? Yeah. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay, the quick description of the API. This is something that you can get out of the three endpoints which have been developed. And yeah, so <laughs> present and future. <laughs> and thanks to okay. everyone. So the next speaker is LaFire again. No. Oh, no, not that one. Oh, not this one? Oh, really? Oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I've got two presentations. Yeah, this one? one? Yes. Okay. Oh. Come on. Okay. Speak. Hello. Uh, so this is Rafael. Uh, so um, unfortunately, just said couldn't make it, and we have, he's a colleague and a good friend, and he asked me to, to present this in on his behalf. Um, so I think this is one of the success stories of um, the uh, biohackathon. So he was uh, here just last year, and and he came up with this idea uh, during the biohackathon, and it was the idea of integrate better um, uh, omics datasets. So he is. Um, he was presenting last year um, a protein exchange, something that has been presented by Eric uh, uh, today. And, and yes, I'm going to present a little bit more about this idea that has been implemented in the last year, and then now it's a product that is live and, and is accessible uh, uh, via, via web. Um, so, all you know, um, uh, uh, PubMed Central so is uh, an index of publication metadata and facilitates the discovery of, of publications. So you can uh, search, find publications. When you find a publication, basically points you uh, to the original paper that is in, in a journal that is participated in, in, in European, uh, sorry, in, in BAME Central. So we want to do something, um, the similar thing for, for data sets. Um, so you have different repositories, uh, for example, GEO, Metabolism Exchange, Protein Exchange that has been presented by Eric. Uh, so the idea is to have as well a common interface uh, where basically you can find uh, all the metadata and points you to all different uh, data sets. So, uh, so this is the goal, to facilitate, to have an index that facilitates the discovery of high quality omics data sets, uh, genomics, proteomics, and transcriptomics, and metabolomics. And, and it's not just um, um, and the discovery, but it's also to provide some added value that helps you uh, to find uh, all the data sets that might be related to your data sets. And, and also the idea is to provide, like, uh, Padme Central, an infrastructure that helps you to, to register and, and to integrate uh, information uh, about data sets and repositories. So this is the uh, interface uh, of Omics DI. Um, so a very nice interface that shows you um, the different ways to, to filter and, and browse uh, data sets. So uh, at the moment, uh, we have nine repositories, uh, almost 5,000 uh, data sets, and, and this is growing. Um, so at the EBI, also, we have a group project that is trying to integrate all the data sets that comes from EBI. But this is an effort that goes beyond um, uh, EBI or, or Europe, so you can see that there are different uh, data sets, um, uh, databases providing data sets from, from different places. Uh, so the data set model is something very simple, uh, relies on, on minimum information, but also recommended fields that helps to, to, to find similarity across uh, different data sets. Um, so there's um, a little bit of, of work, uh, it's not just indexing as I was saying, and this is what I was meaning by added value, so, so there's a validation of, of the information that comes to, to uh, to the omics DI. Um, also, there's metadata enrichment. Um, so, for instance, uh, there is mapping from different identifiers, for instance, from DOI uh, to, to PubMed IDs. Um, 
also ontology mapping. Um, so when he finds uh, th th this, um, or he has some text about, uh, and his PC will try to map to a vocabulary, as well as some ontology enrichment. So he's using annotator to be able to find synonyms of, of diseases. And also something that is, I think, very interesting and very nice is as well, uh, um, it does analysis of data sets based on uh, the, the entries that uh, are part of the data set. So this is an example of, of, of um, uh, a nice functionality that is trying to, to show you similar data sets. And as I was saying before, this, the similarity is not just uh, based on the metadata, but also uh, based on, on biological similarity. So when you get into a data set, it will tell you what all the data sets are similar based on these two types of, of similarity. So um, acknowledgements, especially to the data repositories, um, uh, Atlas, that is represented here by Eric uh, and many others. And, and yes, that's it. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh. Okay. <laughs> so the next speaker is Didia. Hello, um, my name is Lillian Ashmore, and I'm here representing the Bioinformatics Research Laboratory from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Um, today, here I want to talk about um, our efforts for data linking using the Clinical Genome Allele Registry. Some project problems that are addressed by the er, ClinGen Allele Registry are um, canonicalization, which um, describes um, the sort of converging on an expression where multiple variants are described differently but represent the same variant. Um, deduplication, which um, involves basically lifting um, between genome builds. And by linking um, alleles in this way, you can thus link nucleotide and amino acid alleles and allele-related data. Um, the registry in its current form can be accessed um, at reg.clinicalgenome.org. Um, the allele registry is built using data models um, developed by the ClinGen Data Model Working Group, um, which can be described further at datamodel.clinicalgenome.org. Um, in its base form, when variants are submitted, um, either in the amino acid transcript or chromosome sequence um, type, uh, these sequences are sort of, uh, the attributes of these variants are um, converged together to form an expression that uniquely identifies that variant in reference to a particular reference genome. And we call this the contextual allele. Um, then what the registry does on top of that is um, performs the canonicalization and the deduplication that I described previously to assign all those contextual alleles to a canonical allele group, um, which sort of serves as a URI to link all of those contextual alleles. Um, here's kind of a, a walkthrough of the allele registration process. So you'll have variants and you'll submit it to the, the registry and we parse it, um, build the contextual allele expression, um, map that contextual allele um, to a sort of uh, genomic, um, normalized genomic coordinate um, based off of the genome build 38. And um, if that sort of normalized allele has not been registered, it gets registered. If it has, um, and, and the contextual allele specific to that query has as well, then the canonical allele ID is returned. If the canonical group um, exists but the contextual allele does not, then the contextual allele gets registered, um, as well as the canonical allele ID returned as well. Um, the allele registry is RDF and JSON-LD compliant, and we're working on um, sort of implementing provenance standards as well. Um, within the clin clinical genome consortium um, ecosystem, these URIs that the um, registry returns helps us link all variant data that we have warehoused um, for ClinGen. Um, one of the primary sort of use cases of the registry that we are using is known as the pathogenicity calculator. Um, which, here's some screenshots from the UI. Um, what essentially it allows you to do is you query um, a given variant 
um, you can you can submit the contextual allele. It'll ping the registry, give you back the canonical allele ID, all other contextual alleles, and tell you what different labs around the world are saying about that variant. Um, so this helps you sort of um, see the pathogenicity rating of um, variants uh, and what data backs that pathogenicity rating. Um, the pathogenicity ratings are um, accumulated by ACMG AMP guidelines. Um, this is the paper that sort of outlines that. Um, so all evidence codes supporting evidence that you see from the labs are given in this format. Um, Calculator is accessible at calculator.clinicalgenome.org. And by applying the ACMG AMP guidelines automatically, this eliminates a lot of human error that occurs when applying the rules and um, uh, facilitates the resolution of conflict and conclusions about pathogenicity of those variants. So thank you. That is, that's it. <laughs> Peter is Takeshi. Okay. Go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Toshiaki san, um, and for all the organizers. Uh, just uh, three or four minutes, I'll talk about what I will do within this uh, biohackathon. Uh, this is uh, uh, probably the fifth or sixth joining of the biohackathon. Previously, uh, all biohackathon I was researching about, uh, because my specialty is animal evolutions. So uh, previously I was talking about the uh, genome data of um, oh, yeah, genome data of these uh, uh, organisms, but I lost my position. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it to uh, uh, other uh, uh, laboratories. So the new theme is Ugrena, but my current contract finished the coming autumn. I finished the, this theme soon. So, <laughs> what? so now, uh, quickly, uh, this, uh, studying what, what is the Ugrena biology. The interesting thing is the Ugrena biology was started very long, have a long history. The, uh, the first Ravenhook uh, write about that he found the Ugrena. This is the first uh, document of Ugrena. And the published paper was very much uh, uh, it has a long history and increasing, but interestingly, it was recently very much decreasing. <laughs> so what kind of this tendency? The reason is the genome is very difficult to uh, read. So this organ, uh, genome of this organ, that's why so no one success to reading the genome of this. But um, recently, the transcriptome data was increased, uh, including the Arakawa-san uh, and Tomita-san's group. It recently published uh, very nice uh, uh, genomic data. And recently, the uh, mass data and uh, uh, genome for the, um, not for nuclear genome was published, but uh, Kuriolopras DNA was uh, completed. So the idea is uh, the, this organism, uh, uh, model organisms of uh, metabolic pathways for long, but uh, um, recent genomic data and the recent metabolic data and the historical knowledge of enzymatic activity, these kind of papers very much uh, may published is not connected. So in this hackathons, I'd like to make a kind of digital, uh, digital de make a digital data of construction of knowledge of uh, all the uh, hundred papers for enzymes. Uh, so far, more than hundred enzymes were uh, this a list of papers. For each paper, were, uh, related to the what kind of enzymatic activity exists in the um, uh, Ugrena cell extract. So I'd like to make a kind of list of this for making a digital data of this. Okay. So, yeah, that's it. So next is Nobaoki. Yes. <coughs> Okay. Hi. 
Um, so basically, uh, oh, um, the one of the this I, I'm working on the Glytocam project, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, and one of the main points that I really wanted to talk um, and get input from people uh, here is that we're basically utilizing RDF technology. It's a brand new system that we've created, um, but but we what we want to do is have it have be dynamic. So users will have be able to register uh, ontology data directly and edit it or uh, modify it uh, how they how they like. And and so far we've been making it, we've made a very simple web system, and it's it's become possible where users input the data directly through the web system and they can access that data through a triple store for other people. Um, some background, th this is the, the Glytocam project. It's basically another um, uh, a system for uh, identif ident giving identifiers to uh, glycan structures. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot of um, interaction with uh, a lot of different people. And so having um, solid data and having it uh, properly registered is pretty important for the system to, to work. Um, this is our uh, system architecture. Uh, basically, what um, the, the, this is there's a lot of different things, but one the main part I'd like to focus on uh, today is basically the API, which is the main system that we will be using to access the RDF data directly. <clears throat> so th that's the goal. Um, but what what the question that we faced uh, was basically is there a, uh, an easy way to do that? Um, basically, registering dynamic dynamically uh, data into the RDF. Um, and so, one th one thing that I've found with my experience is that it's 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 safe as long as we are uh, properly testing um, our methods. And so, <clears throat> um, one thing that ha happened out of this project is that we're we're using Java for everything and um, the Spring framework. And uh, what what we've been able to do is extend the framework so that we can do transactional testing. Uh, basically, we can run a test case to confirm that our Sparkle queries. Or, uh, or, uh, Sparkle query works. We can insert some data and then make sure that uh, basically the f we have to first check if the data does not exist. We do this is, and then test to make sure that the uh, the insert runs correctly, and then make sure that uh, afterwards that that data does truly exist. The problem is if you run this test test multiple times, it will fail at the beginning part here because that data should not exist. Um, but having it uh, in a transactional um, process basically rolls everything back uh, from that test case. Um, and so basically with this we were able to create um, test cases for all of the different types of uh, data that we'd like to insert and be sure that the queries that we are running um, match with that data uh, exactly. And so basically the, the, this has become part of a, a separate package, um, part of uh, the, the Glytocam project. Um, so these are our various test cases that we've run. We're running on Jenkins so that it's uh, continuously uh, integrated. Um, and this is our milestones. Uh, basically, by March 2016, we hope to be able to complete our um, uh, API uh, and basically be done with uh, the, 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 at least the major part of this, this project. Um, what we'd like to do uh, during this bio hackathon is um, ha basically integrate federated queries with other public databases, uh, share the dockerized environment, uh, the development environment that we have so that more people can collaborate with the, the system and also the sharing the source code so that we can uh, hopefully get more people involved and uh, expand the functionality that we'll be offering. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is uh, the, the documentation site, so if anybody's interested, uh, please come and ask me questions. So the next speaker is Masya san. My name is Hiroshi Masya from uh, Hurricane Virus Resource Center uh, in Tsukuba City in Japan. Uh, we are working on the uh, phenotype data integration project in Japan. Uh, that is supported by the Database Integration Corporation program in UNDBDC. Uh, aim of the project is uh, collect uh, phenotype data from uh, Japanese databases and uh, integrate uh, with RDF technology and uh, disseminate it uh, widely and uh, to uh, collaborate with the international uh, 
uh, one of the data databases, and also uh, widely uh, data dissemination across research domains. So uh, this is an overview of the JFENOM project. Uh, actually, we are uh, very simply uh, correct uh, data uh, from Japanese databases and also uh, international uh, collaborative uh, consortium databases. Uh, they have their own databases, but uh, we uh, simply uh, re uh, constitute or uh, convert uh, our DF data uh, from original. Uh, and uh, and uh, we put the data on the uh, Riken meta database uh, developed by the uh, Nori Kobayashi. Uh, he, he said uh, the uh, backbone of the, this database is very strong and stable. Uh, please uh, ask uh, in detail uh, for him. And, uh, and also, uh, this is the overview. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, use uh, animation of the. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So, oh, uh, this, uh, uh, we can set table and card and uh, back down all those Spark endpoint. Uh, these data are uh, composed by uh, Terui Takatsuki, and she is, she will uh, working on uh, rat data uh, in this uh, by Hakasan. And also, uh, we uh, would like expand use of the Japanese phenotype data using uh, Monarch data, uh, so bridging phenotype data to uh, disease data. Uh, we import uh, Monarch data. And uh, we are uh, developing uh, some uh, GUI uh, to, for example, searching mouse phenotype by Parkinson disease and uh, system uh, answers the uh, phenotypes uh, related to the dis diseases. Uh, this uh, software is developed by, in, in, uh, developed by uh, Sadahiro, where is Sadahiro? Uh, Sadahiro Kumagai. Uh, and, uh, and also, oh, uh, we would like to uh, uh, disseminate Japanese phenotype data to our world. Uh, we would like to transport, uh, transfer our data to Monarch and also oh, uh, to the, uh, some uh, so rare, disease, uh, rare disease database uh, in Japan. Uh, and also, oh, uh, some other uh, data framework. This is this is a Garuda uh, Alliance program. Uh, so oh, this is a uh, data, uh, data framework uh, for the uh, system biology. So oh, in this uh, Hakson, uh, we would like to uh, discuss uh, Monarch portion portion uh, with us uh, to expand our Japanese uh, use use of Japanese phenotype data. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next is Sebastian Chan. Okay, um, now I will talk about a few ideas uh, we have on establishing biomedical edges in Wikidata by uh, making problems into games because people apparently like games. Um, so I am affiliated with the Scripps Research uh, group of Andrew Sue uh, and I work together with Tim on the other project we have. Um, Okay, so quickly again about Wikidata, we already heard that today, but I will just walk you through again. So, what Wikipedia is for structure uh, for text is Wikidata for structured data, and both are strongly interlinked. So, what you see in the info box uh, is currently not drawn from Wikidata, but is supposed to be on the long run uh, directly queried from Wikidata. And what Wikidata is essentially, um, it's composed of of, um, <coughs> of statements uh, and of items which have statements on them. And essentially, 
um, his statements are properties uh, which have values and uh, qualifiers if need and uh, together this is called a claim and if they are sourced together all together this is called a, a statement um, in this case it's London with a population at some point in time um, and essentially the item is a, a node and the property is an edge, so essentially it's a graph database and it resembles this like generic semantic web graph database and via the Sparkle endpoint uh, and the Wikidata ontology it's also integrated with the semantic web. So what we did is essentially uh, import genes, diseases and drugs and I have been working in a few uh, last weeks to do the interaction between drugs and proteins uh, and diseases and drugs. Um, so, but what we see uh, is that it always lags behind strongly if the FDA releases something or a new, a new study publishes a great uh, benefit uh, for patients for a, uh, on a drug. So it takes months to years until this knowledge ends up in databases. So I think, so the idea was to come up with a process which is uh, faster. And the idea would be that uh, there are many options how to do it, but the idea would be that you go to Science Daily, uh, grab the data, these re regular press releases, and let people out of these press releases, which are usually referenced. So uh, if you scroll down this page, you usually have uh, a reference to, to a journal article and you can then establish uh, via a game this, this edge in Wikidata. So um, in this case it's a new finding about an antibody and you could establish that. So what I did in this, uh, this is the journal article uh, the press release was talking about um, and um, you can establish the drug to, to protein edge but or the drug to disease edge. In my case, I now established the drug to disease edge, which is really easy because it just says um, it this drug, which is an antibody, inhibits this IL seven. Uh, uh, sorry, um, leads to curation of psoriasis and. As this data is not in uh, there for this paper, there is not even a PubMed ID, so I just added the journal reference. You could also use a DOI or whatever you like as a reference. So if we gamified that, you could really uh, much more speed up this process of repre uh, representing drug disease interactions and basically any other interaction you can gamify into Wikidata. Um, what what should we do? What can we do? Um, the community process, uh, let the community uh, process these daily press releases from FDA, Science Daily and others. So, um, this needs to be a simple and appealing uh, mobile friendly app and um, it could be pre-annotated in Wikidata. Um, it requires multiple users maybe to establish one, uh, one edge and um, to motivate the users more, you could have a scoreboard and a uh, graph uh, and a the weekly, pr uh, month, yearly price or something. And why do we do that? Establish structured reference biodata from uh, publications, uh, generate CC0 data, uh, uh, enable and use the Wikidata crowd and uh, add value to Wikidata and Wikipedia's and to scientists as well. So yeah, thanks to my group, I'm at the end. <laughs> Okay, first of all, thanks to the organizers. Okay, I'm Eric Antesana, I'm one of the three Eric's attending the hackathon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in the next couple of minutes I'm going to present a, a new project that, uh, in which we've been busy since a couple of months ago that is tackling a particular domain which is the plant breeding domain. And within this particular domain we are interested in how to handle the information and the knowledge by using these, yeah, these new technologies that are yeah, new for our colleagues. So basically here what we wanted to, to tackle were two things, one on the technical side to see whether these technologies are ready for, for yeah, dealing with this type of information, this type of knowledge, 
And on the second, let's say, hand, to also see what, whether we could discover new insights using these technologies. So I'm going to give you an overview, a really helicopter view of what has been done so far. And if you, have, if you want to have more details, please come to me. Okay, so what's, what was the motivation to, to start this, this new project? Well, first of all, as in many of our, all the projects that you might have faced, is the lack of a standardized vocabulary. So in this particular case, it was the same again for this particular group of people. Not only the plant breeders, I mean, the ones that are the real actors in this domain, but also seed growers, field testers, wet lab scientists, trap life scientists, and plenty of other people. So what we wanted to, have to, to do at, that, at this level was to try to come up with a one new standard probably or try to solve at least the issues that were already in that in those particular domains and as a second point well we know that there are a lot of uh, resources actually to 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 make research in this domain but the ones that are really computationally supported supporting the, the shareability of data are really reduced and so it means that it's really hard to compare the data hard to share the data to reproduce experiments and these sort of things so basically classical things that we are facing in this domain so what we have done is to, to start implementing, uh, implementing a proof of concept. So to answer the question whether these technologies, semantic web technologies, are ready to, are of any help in this, in this case. First of all, of course, we've been looking what is already out there. Because, you know, there are already plenty of things, nice work of uh, other colleagues, other people that are working in similar domains or close domains, like uh, the people that develop the crop ontology, the trait ontology. We are dealing with the species, of course, we have to tackle at some point the taxonomy of the species. There are also major communities like the, like the agri-semantics, the plantium, maybe some of you have already heard about it, and plenty of others. Well, some issues about these uh, knowledge organization systems are they are dispersed, siloed, well, not all of them. And yeah, to, to, to try to match our use cases what not, was not that easy. Like, uh, yeah, playing with all those dispersed, dispersed uh, knowledge organization systems. And on the other hand, I mean, to complicate things, uh, we had to deal with plenty of many new variables, like weather, soil, genetics, and so we've been playing at different levels of knowledge, let's say. So we wanted to have, uh, again, like a new relevant knowledge organization system so that we could tackle a couple of uh, new, let's say, trend, uh, trends in agriculture, like precision agriculture, for instance, forecast yield and these sort of things. There are classical data challenges like the diversity of formats. And another important point that was highly raised uh, in our, for, by our users was the lack of measurement standards, for instance, or how to, to, to measure or how to, let's say, get the standards on, on the things that they are observing, like phenotypes, traits, and these sort of things. So that was the question. So can we do something with semantic web? So, so far, well, to, to start answering this question, we came up with a new ontology that is, was, is built based on the existing resources. Like you can recognize here the trait ontology, even the gene ontology, the very famous ontologies. We collected so far around 250 terms. There was a manual and automatic curation in different languages, some synonyms and cross references. and getting exports in different formats and yeah, trying to get sort, uh, information from uh, ma the major sources like the FAO, for instance, on some breeding databases and of course from the domain experts. So this is just showing you a, a, one of the branches. Of course, you cannot read anything, but yeah, it's just to show the complexity on which we are dealing. Just, just a zoom in to see it, yeah, to have a, to, so that you can have a grasp of the type of terms that we are dealing with. Anyway. So this is already implemented in one of our clusters. We have a cluster of around uh, 12 uh, triple, sto uh, triple stores. We are using Virtuoso. And there we have our little system that is trying to match there. So of course, this is part of a, a larger infrastructure where we are trying to match and get connections with transactional event data, master data. And yeah, one of the important components is, of course, the governance, how to deal with this, who is the data owner, and stuff like that. Yeah, this is. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so first of all, thank you Toshi for uh, inviting me to this by hackathon. Um, so um, we have been working on experimental protocols and some other things that we started 
on last year, um, and this is uh, precisely what I'm what I'm going to be going to talk talking about. So uh, from 2015 to uh, 2016, uh, we started to work uh, with um, Arto Benedict on HDT and how to move uh, from HDT to bio HDT. So HTT basically keeps big RDF datasets compressed while maintaining um, search and browse operations. It's, it's just a, another way to serialize RDF. Um, and we also started to work on representing uh, experimental protocols. So we wanted to move uh, from the information retrieval problem. Uh, we, we were starting to uh, address a, a issue of information retrieval uh, with respect to experimental protocols. And then we, uh, once we started uh, to address the information material problem, we realized that uh, we were moving uh, into the automatization problem uh, for what has to do with experimental protocols because we thought that protocols uh, should be defined by humans and executed by uh, combinations of robots and humans. Um, so for what has to do with HTT for biosciences, uh, basically, um, we didn't go very far. There were many issues. Uh, by base, uh, the tooling, for instance, there, uh, the tooling that is available for uh, creating HTT datasets is, is very uh, poor. Uh, we tried very hard to um, transform uh, the whole of uh, BioTORTF into uh, HTT format, but it's, it, it didn't. We didn't really uh, do much. So uh, this is something that we want to work on in, the, in this uh, bio hackathon. Um, this um, this working group, the, the BioHTT uh, working group, um, will be working on fixing the tooling and transforming um, as a proof of concept bio 2 rdf to uh, BioHTT by the end of a week, if, if such a thing is possible. And current interest bodies include uh, me, Arto, Evan, Michael, and Raul. Um, with respect to ex the work that we started uh, with experimental protocols, uh, with, uh, experimental protocols are basically the kind of documents that people working in labs uh, have to deal with on a, ba on a daily basis. They are basically like cooking recipes where they have all the ingredients, the samples, the instruments, and the regions, and where basically uh, the whole workflow that they follow in a lab, in any kind of lab experiment or any kind of lab operation, uh, is well described. So. Uh, the experimental protocols should have complete information that allow that uh, that should allow anybody to recreate an experiment on any given point, um, and they are not always um, part of uh, lab information management systems. Uh, sometimes lab information management systems um, deal with experimental protocols in the same way as they deal with any kind of document. Um, so uh, experimental protocols are. Um, and we started to consider experimental protocols from the literature-based uh, literature, um, uh, discovery um, perspective. And finally, we, we ended up considering experimental protocols as pivots for uh, um, producing data. Because all the information for producing data and all the uh, real information for, uh, that, that is very uh, relevant to data, for re reusable data, is actually in the experimental protocol. Um, so the main issues that we identified last year were vocabularies, the lack of vocabularies for um, uh, wet lab activities, um, the, uh, and also issues with, ha with ha what has to do with the workflow, with the definition of a workflow for wet lab activities. Um, and this year we, we specifically want to address the issues that we identified last year and that we kept on working uh, with Tassero, who is the next one, the one following after my presentation. Uh, we want to work on a proper model for uh, workflows for experimental protocols. We also want to evaluate, um, we, and, and we want to do that by evaluating existing uh, workflow models. Um, we basically don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to define a running example. We want to gather more use cases, uh, although we have been gathering a lot of use cases uh, from uh, published literature, but uh, we want to see if we can have something much more complex that, that one, uh, you can find in, in, in published literature. Um, and we also want to finish our position statement paper, which is basically what, what we have set out to do during this um, bio hackathon. So, thank you. Okay, um, my name is Tasro. I'm 
one of the organizers of this hackathon from the University Center for Life Science. And I'm going to talk about the, the experimental protocol and uh, the Alex told what we have done the the last hackathon. But I'm going to, to present to you about the motivation of this pro, uh, project. Because experimental protocols are not structured and they're so ambiguous that we cannot reproduce the results. And I'm calling this problem as a mixed gentry problem. So these are the lines uh, from the many protocols and they, they, ha they have so many um, description about uh, um, such a ambiguous information like a gentry vortex or mixed gently how, how gently and, and they use in poor scripts so the what scripts so this is not helpful this this has nothing so all I can say is I dare you so um, what we have been doing uh, so what we have done is uh, presented by the Alexa and since the last hackathon um, and yeah, the, the before that, uh, Jean-Luc and the Eric and the Rx and the I worked together in Lang Circulacy. And since then, I have been working to, to populate the examples of, of the, the real protocols to the machine readable form. And I have also worked with people from companies of, of, the, of the biological experimental robots. And they are um, developing the robots with two arms. They're doing the experimental stuff. And the six persons are coming to join the hacks in tomorrow. So may maybe you can ask them to, to, to show the, how they are doing the, the rob stuff so nicely. And uh, and here's the the brief uh, sketches uh, of of the of the conversion of the real sample, and uh, this is the RNA sequencing sample pro protocols and into into the the, the machine readable form. I mean that these are the 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 graphs of the of the processes which I combined from the natural language protocol, and uh, we country. Don't have uh, any any core GUI to 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 write the protocols. So biologists required such kind of the GUI to to edit the the RDF data, but we don't have it. So now we are working with with the the, the simple Markdown format to to convert from the natural language to the to the machine readable format. And what we're going to do in this hackathon is to raise the, the use cases of in, uh, introdu introducing the semantic web technologies to, to the wet lab. Wet lab. And um, the, what we want, really want to do is to, to, to write a position statement paper to, to show the, our ideas and the how, how this idea to, helps to help the, the wet lab trees. And uh, we will welcome all of you and the uh, biologists and uh, pharmacologists, the information in some So, um, any any comments or suggestions or questions are all welcome. So please come to uh, come to join us during the hackathon. We all welcome you. Thank you so much. So next speaker is now Hisa. Okay. Hi. My name is Naomi Sagoto from Osaka University. And now I'm talking about BioRuby. Uh, BioRuby is an uh, open source bioinformatics software library and tools written in the Ruby programming language. And current version is 1.54.0. A uh, website is here. And we have started this project in uh, 2000 and continue developing over uh, 15 years. And Many, com many people contributed it to the project, and over 30 people around the world have been contributed. And we, uh, in BioRuby, uh, many uh, features are available. 
and uh, we and currently a uh, plugin system is available uh, called BioGenus. Uh, website is here and this is a uh, list of uh, bio, uh, list of uh, Ruby packages involving biology. Over hundreds of packages are available. And last year, uh, we released WireV 1.5.0. And in these versions, uh, some improvements and refactoring are done. And in, in this hackathon, uh, because uh, in WireV, uh, many uh, functions uh, we in BioRuby uh, a lot of uh, features are in one package so uh, so I'd like to uh, split the package uh, Oh, sorry. So I'd like to split BioRuby into several uh, gem packages for reducing maintenance costs and adding improvements to basic uh, data structure, for example, sequences and gene bank, and so on, uh, for uh, supporting better RDF. And uh, I hope I'd like to release new version in this year. Uh, so please, if you are interested, please join us. And in, in, in this February, uh, scientists using Ruby in Japan uh, start collaborating uh, called SciRuby JP uh, to promote developing scientific software in Ruby, including statistics and machine learning. So, uh, if you are interested, uh, see the Google Groups and Slack. Thank you. So the next speaker is Atsuko, and she will give uh, two talks in, yes. uh, in, on behalf of the Yasnori, yes, because yes. he couldn't make it today, so. Okay, so you have five minutes each. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm Atsuko Yamaguchi from Database Center for Life, Life Science. At first, I would like to talk about the Sparkle Builder project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Okay, <laughs> um, background is uh, for almost biologists, it's difficult to understand the sch um, schema of RDF data and construct Sparkle queries. Sparkle is a generation system designed for users who are not familiar with RDF and Sparkle is required. So our method to generate Sparkle query is like this, and first, uh, extract cross-cross relationships from public Sparkle endpoint. After that, we compute possible relationships. Um, it is um, paths between classes, and that after that, display them for user to select one. If user select one relationship, from the relationship, um, system generates Sparkle query from uh, Sparkle query. And I, I said relationship is a path between classes. And why, why relationship is path? It, it, uh, I would like to explain why relationship is path. For example, if a user would like to know um, from their, uh, their interested genes to uh, you know, they would like to know disease, uh, related disease, 
and but um, a user doesn't know how their desired relationship are expressed in RDF data set. So, for example, um, the relationship may um, be expressed as a property A or opposite um, the direction of property B, or it may be uh, multi-step of properties. Using uh, so um, we should um, um, relate um, possible relationships be uh, between uh, it's uh, possible relation possible passes between classes and display. After um, this uh, we after display, if user use uh, select one um, pass using the, this kind of um, GUI. Then um, Spark query is generated. Um, using the, our method, this um, Spark Builder system is um, developed. Um, develop, uh, by developing our system, we have uh, some technical problems. One problem, for example, the number of paths is very large. So ranking measures for passes is required. And um, only resources having um, classes can be retrieved because we uh, only fo focus on class-class relationships. So some inferences should be needed, I, we, so, uh, we think. And um, which, um, which Spark endpoint should be used for searching data, especially for um, federated searching, because if uh, if only one Spark endpoint died, so uh, we cannot um, get a uh, whole result from related search. Uh, or if um, only one endpoint has a um, wrong or um, um, okay. wrong result, <laughs> so um, the result is uh, not um, good. So we need um, evaluation system for Spark endpoint and it's um, really related to uh, um, the next um, next presentation. Thank you. Then uh, I would like to um, talk about Yami uh, Yami Umaka data uh, which, um, on behalf of uh, Yasunori Yamamoto. Um, Four years ago, um, when a biohackathon held in Toyama, um, Yami data was start, uh, started, and goal was, uh, goal, the goal was Yami data project. It provides a measure of data quality hosted in Sparkle endpoint. At that time, actually, I didn't um, collaborate with this. <laughs> Um, this um, project, but um, uh, a project. And through the twist and the turns, um, last year I, sh I need a kind, this kind of evaluation um, system be uh, as I told in the um, previous presentation. So we restarted Yami data um, named Umaka. Um, that's um, that is a um, direct Kyushu area, and that means um, yummy, actually. <laughs> um, this, um, this system um, collecting data with history of as follows. Um, for example, availability, it's a, a, um, alive or not, or dis um, discoverability. Uh, which has a void or um, service description, or fi um, how uh, fishness, which is um, how often updated, and web data readiness, whether linked data principle are followed, and performance, how, how, fast, how fast to process a query, and much less friendliness, whether cause is supported or not. Um, Currently, 104 endpoints are targeted. 
And um, every day we um, we searching, uh, we investing this kind of data. And we uh, we would like to um, be uh, Umaka data. Uh, we, we would like Umaka and Yami data to be a place where providers and consumers communicate with others. And uh, we we also would like to be um, uh, we would like um, provide procedure, procedures of collecting data and obtain data. And we would like to provide relevant references to official documents such as WCC recommendations. Yes, thank you. Do you use it? Yes. Okay, please start. <clears throat> ah, thank you, I'm Chindo Kim. Uh, finally, it's the final talk of today. Uh, I will be talk about LODCA, which is an acronym for question answering of a linked open data. And uh, I will talk with this uh, focus on um, data set uh, agnosticity. <coughs> so in a previous talk, uh, Achiko talked about why we need a tool to assist uh, Sparkle uh, authoring. And Lodka is another tool to uh, help uh, uh, Sparkle authoring. And this is the uh, screenshot of Lodka. Uh, you can actually access this system uh, through lodka.org. <coughs> and um, this system has um, three components. Uh, it accepts a uh, natural language uh, question as an input. And the first uh, component, Graphicator, converts the, the natural language query into graph representation. Or a user can directly um, compose a graph representation. And then the next step is to find uh, URIs that are required uh, to generate uh, Sparkle queries. And then finally, the graph finder module automatically generates Sparkle queries from this representation. Uh, it actually uh, produces multiple Sparkle queries. Some of them fails to find the answer, but some of them can find the answer. This is uh, one Sparkle query that could find answers. And uh, this, is another, this is another Sparkle query that could find answers. And um, Lodka is um, developed with this uh, aspect in mind. So um, we are developing it to be uh, data set agnostic. So um, among the three modules, uh, Graphicator module is data set agnostic. So it can be applied to any Sparkle endpoint. Graph Finder is also data set agnostic. Only this term Finder is some data set dependent. But, um, uh, the component is pluggable, so we can plug in uh, this component for different uh, Sparkle endpoints. And I will skip how we uh, implemented uh, data set agnosticity for uh, Graph Finder. And uh, it's because um, only this module is not data set agnostic, uh, we need to prepare uh, what I call a uh, dictionary. So this is actually a configuration. Uh, this is actually a configuration for this GNET. Uh, so other parts are trivial, but only um, this part's uh, dictionary. Prepare, preparing dictionary is kind of the most uh, important part. And, um, to do it, uh, we are now using pub dictionaries. Pub dictionaries is an uh, open repository of dictionaries. With dictionary, I mean it's a mapping between uh, 
textual representation and corresponding URIs. If we can collect uh, this um, resource, then we can call it from Lodka to find um, URIs. And um, so far, we made um, six configurations for six different um, uh, Sparkle endpoints. And um, now, uh, Lodka is configured to first you have to choose the Sparkle endpoint you want to search against, and then uh, you can uh, search. And for the uh, later configuration, we would like to implement the meta search or uh, federated search. Important feature is that for this, um, Lodka does not require this data sets to be integrated or standardized in terms of representation or vocabulary. That's um, thanks to the data set agnostic uh, feature of Lodka. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.